Tusk has no military food. Day three of uh, audio feed. It's not too bad today. I'm feeling pretty good. I didn't do an outro again because the batteries and the video card filled up. So I didn't get Living Sacrifice and uh, Grave Robber, but they put on good shows. So nevertheless, stick around for some more. My wife, if you don't, most of you guys don't, some of you do. Um, my wife is a very, very soft-spoken, strong lady. She is... I've always considered her to be much more grounded in faith than me because she just has this faith that is just, it's just a fortress. But in my life, uh, she's the one God uses to kind of bring me back to faith. You know, you ever, you have those people in your life that remind you. She's always been that one. So for the fact that, that she was crying, I knew something was up. That doesn't, that's not something that's very common for her. So anyway, finally, I, um, she said, I, I can't talk right now on the phone. And when I get home, I'll, I'll let you know what's going on. So, man, my heart just goes pounding in my chest. I don't know what's going on, but it's something bad enough that she can't even tell me over the phone. So it's something bad. She gets home, and she's busy and around the house and kind of doing her thing. And I said, well, are you going to tell me what's going on? Well, and, and she goes over and she starts washing dishes. And I'm like, this is really, really out of character for her. So I... I pressed her to tell me what's going on. What is going on? So she came over to the table where I was sitting. And she pulled out the chair and she sat down and she just fell apart crying. She said, I don't really know how to tell you this other than just to let you know that we have this. Um, we, this and it happens nearly in every nurse's life career at some point. We had this patient and I got stuck with a needle and she said that needle because of that stick she said we have to do testing and they start testing for HIV so she started testing for HIV first one came back she said this was actually several months ago she said I didn't tell you because it came back fine no big deal but they had a three-month follow-up and she said this time it didn't come back okay she starts crying and she can't, she just really, just can't really talk about it. So we, of course, I just fall apart. She falls apart. She said, today we've got to go into town and we've got to get you tested. We've got to take you to get you tested. And that was probably about 9 o'clock in the morning. It was probably 1.30 in the afternoon before we were able to get a test, go through the whole thing. And during that period of time, all this stuff, is going through your mind. Have you ever been face to face with something that you just don't know how to process? I mean, you just don't know what to do with it. And that's what was going on with me. I just didn't know what to do with this. I had no idea how to process this. Didn't know what was going on. Of course, I'm on my phone pulling up, you know, what does this mean? What does it do? For, what does it mean for the rest of your life? And um, the test came back negative. They tested her. Her test came back negative. So the doctor started telling us, you know, it's very common that you have a false positive on this test. He said it's very common. It's not an uncommon thing at all. You know, and, and so Tammy says, okay, well, how common is it? Oh, yeah, but like one in several thousand will come back as a false positive. That doesn't sound common to me. But she says, and just tell me guys about it, I'm getting flushed you know she she said um, talk to the people that that gave you the test and, and to test and find out what they say and of course Tammy does and they're like yeah we've had some issues with our testing here lately huh. you know huh. we've had several false positives lately well my cha then it changed in my mind of course we're we're very relieved you know wow you got your life back the way you thought you had but now, and, and since then, my life has, has changed the way I look at it because now it's a, it's a difference of, of um, a lot of people's tests don't come back negative. A lot of people's tests come back positive and remain positive. And 
even telling the story, you almost feel, or I almost feel guilty by being able to say that it was wrong. Because how many people, I, mean, I don't know you guys, how many people do I come in contact with every day that are walking around with a positive test? It's changed the way of living. It's changed the way of living. Now I'm going to take that and, and look, I will have a test that comes back positive. You know, eventually, one day we're all going to face a very real death. We really will. And it may be something that I cause. It may be something that is a natural thing. It may be something that is inflicted. We don't know what that is. But the, the fact that we walk around, and I walk around through life so many times, as if I've got this life licked. I've got this thing under control. You know, I, I, I've got this down. It's just really not the case because we are all just waiting for that positive test. We're all waiting for something to come back. It's going to happen. But you can't live your life as a death. You live your life as life, right? But I want to go back and look at where all that came from. If you go back to Genesis chapter 2, verse 20, and this is not going to take very long. But it changed the way, whenever I, I studied this, this passage of Scripture kind of changed the way I looked at sacrifice. And that's what I want to look at, sacrifice today. And sacrifice changes our outlook. It changes the way we think. It changes the approach that, that we have to life. And it, the life that we live is changed because it has encountered death. Um, verse 21. The, the, well, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm in a completely wrong spot. Um, Genesis chapter 3, verse 7. They had eaten the fruit, and suddenly their eyes were opened. Sin had entered their life. It changed everything. And when this happened, they looked at each other and immediately realized that they were naked. A brand new realization. They had no understanding of what that was prior to sin. No understanding of it. And whenever that happened, um, and their eyes were opened, they, they, they felt shame in their nakedness. So they tried to do some things to cover that by, by taking fig leaves. And, and if you've ever, I have a fig tree with great big leaves on it. And it's a great concept because it's a great big leaf and it can cover up your body easily because it's big. But it's very, it's, it's super fragile. You, you try to sew together a fig leaf, it's, it's absolutely pointless. So it's a very tender leaf and it just doesn't work. And... Um, so anyway, they tried to string these fig leaves together. And of course, God comes out to them. He says to them, you know, what's going on? What are you doing? What are you thinking? He's talking to them about the, the you know, why, why do you even see that you're naked? Why are you even saying that you're naked? He knew. It wasn't because God didn't know, right? He knew. And as this happened, and he and he he realized the the sin, he saw in their face the shame for each other. God performed the very first sacrifice. It says that, and whenever you look at at verse twenty one, says it, it's just it's a kind of a in my own life, it's it's kind of an overwhelming statement, but it's very simple in the Bible. It says that the Lord God made clothing from animal skins for Adam and his wife. He's vibrant. He's alive. God should be experiential. He should be something that is not merely a theology or a doctrine or even something that we just simply believe in or follow, but more than that, he should be exactly what he describes himself as being a friend of the and a brother. Someone that's really integrated into our everyday life. You know? Hey, I mean, I grew up in a... I'm uh, 39 years old, grew up in a Pentecostal church where rock was not really 
popular or not really, uh, how to say it, not something you would listen to in the Rupert Shah. But my brother, he was, you know, into uh, like all the old Christian rock bands like Jerusalem and like the Resurrection Band and, and even Striper. So very early on, I remember I was told, like seven years old, the first time I was into Striper. Still my favorite band. And I remember I was watching uh, the backside of, um, I think it was the old Black Attack, and I thought that that was so cool. And I was bragging about the band to all my friends, saying, like, hey, they're not girls, they are actually guys. <laughs> 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 And I, this is, I always wanted to, I had the dream about doing something like that. I remember, like, in the, I think we were seven or eight years old, uh, maybe a little long, now older, and uh, Christian, the guitar player of x and Peter, the vocalist of x and myself, they're my cousins, by the way. They didn't live next door. And I remember I would bring a couple of tapes to their house, and uh, I remember we went up to their bedroom, they, have like the attic that have the bedroom and we would put on the resurrection band and really loud and we would pretend that we were playing. And I was the drummer. He, he was the uh, guitar player or or like uh, or something like that. So I mean very early on we wanted to do this and we just had this strong urge that yeah this is something that we need to do at some point. And but that was not easy when you're from a Pentecostal church uh, and uh, when no one around you really are not in metal at all. I mean, the first people that I met that were in metal with like my brother was like, you know, the, the kids at school that were in Metallica and I remember I got my first drum kit when I was 11. Uh, the first thing when uh, I came to junior high, they wanted to, they wanted to play in this Metallica core band and I refused. At well, first I said yes, but then after a while I said no, I really want to play in a Christian rock band. I can play this. And, and uh, we, uh, so at the age, uh, actually after 93 uh, on a Norwegian festival called Seaside Festival, uh, but do you know the band called, a band called Bride? Yeah! Yeah, yeah. they really, um, I was a fan of them since probably 1990 or something. Was that I experienced myself, my brother had nothing to do with them. And they came to Norway to play right after the place in the playground. And I remember I was being there, I was I was just standing there, I knew all the words, I knew all the songs, and uh, I had like you know short hair, I was not, not really a metal head. I had my bright shirt that I had you know imported from America and and I was so touched and I, so when I got back home from the festival I just I said to Christian. Guys, we need to start a band. The week after that show, we started next one. And uh, that was in 93, number 93. And uh, it was not the easiest thing to start to play, you know, a little extra music. The first thing we did was, you know, we did some improv with the bride, cover songs, something like that. But later on, we started to do, you know, because we were listening to so much uh, Christian experience music, like Windows Rising, was probably one of the bigger influences. And then later on, you had like Believer, and you had like Modification that did the death metal. I think Modification was probably the reason why we started to play death metal at all. And uh, later on, we understood that okay, the, the metal scene is bigger than the Christian metal scene. We didn't know that back then. And um, uh, <clears throat> so we became a band. I think like in '95, we, we started to become like a decent death metal band. And we played quite much around the flow. We would play all the secular festivals that we could play at, or, or any show that anyone would put up, we'd play. And I just remember, uh, because we were rehearsing the, the Pentecostal church, they would let us practice. And the reason for that was probably that my family uh, was, was leaders of the church, many of the leaders of the church, we would, they let us practice. We would practice there like probably two or three times a week. And uh, if you would be on the outside of the church, you'd probably hear you know, like, like that. We didn't realize that because we were just inside you know, playing. And I, I, I actually uh, I'm very thankful for a lot of people in the church that actually uh, gave us the opportunity to do that. But on the other hand, there were quite many people in the church that thought that they, they didn't understand anything about what we do. 
did it was, you know, we had a concert in the church, the church in 93, and or in 94, that was the first concert. So I remember Peter, the last song, he was just rolling uh, deep vocals, you know. And I remember when the leaders came to Peter, and he would say, uh, that's last week or two weeks before, or earlier, he had been part of like an exorcism, or, you know, they, they were praying for someone that was being possessed. And the way Peter Vogel sounded was really similar to the voice that this woman have had when they have been, you know, like, pray for her. So he was extremely skeptical for what we were doing, and he was kind of guiding us, and kind of like advising us not to do this, and that we needed to change. Uh, that was like, probably like, you know, uh, that type of mentality we met quite much. And the older we got, the better we had, or the, the more we played, and the better or bad, or bad we got. Um, the better, the more brutal we got as well. We got a lot of hair, you know, and in 96 we probably looked like a proper death metal band. You know, they were brutal in the face. And uh, we wanted to, we didn't want to play to make the stream shows. The shows, we would like to, you know, we wanted to, to, do the, to play among the, the regular bands out there. And, for those of you that, that don't know, we are from. We were based out of Oslo, just outside Oslo, and Oslo was pretty much the capital of the black metal movement that started in Norway in the early nineties. So many of the shows that we wanted to, to play on or be part of had a lot of black metal bands there as well. And back then, it's, I mean, it's not like now. Like there was like a black metal band playing here yesterday, wasn't it? Like, yeah, I hope I want extremely good music, extremely talented musicians, and uh, yeah, it was a great show. But anyways, I mean, back then, Black Metal was, it was extremely, how to say it, super provocative, super anti-Christ, super anti-system, and, and uh, super anti-power. It was like a party, but it had like this, um, yeah, it's what do you think? Uh, I'm not sure how satanic it was, but in the sense of worshiping Satan or relating to Satan, but it was extremely anti Jesus. So for us, uh, <clears throat> so for us uh, playing in that scene, I mean, wanted, we really wanted to be part of that scene. We really, really, there's like this bar called, there was this bar called Elm Street where all the bands were out. Mayhem, Dark Throne, uh, Guys from Emperor, all those Norwegian black metal bands, they would hang out there. And we wanted to do that as well. I remember the first time we went there, it was like in 94. I had like a fortification t shirt, which I think uh, a friend of mine had a Parmesan t shirt. So, you know, we would come in there, you know, being like Christian kids. And I remember that some guy from Mayhem would be in the corner there. And uh, at some point, the guy started to spit on us, you know? And it got extremely uncomfortable. I remember Christopher had like this, yeah, someone spit in, in his face. It was like, you know, like, really like, you know, it was a bit scary. We were just kids, of course. I don't know, like 17, 16, 17. So we left, you know, and, but still we kept coming back. And we, we were there, everyone else was drinking beer. We were drinking coffee. All the time, drinking coffee, you know, like, they would probably have three to refill or we would, you know, get to the machine. Uh, but we had the, the heart that we had was that we we wanted to show people Jesus. We wanted to be in this subculture. We wanted to make friends there. But they didn't want us to. They, they didn't want to be friends with us. Friends with us, you know. And uh, we wanted to play with these bands, these bands. We wanted to share the stage with these bands. But they didn't want to play with us. And uh, the rumor, I mean, even though we wouldn't tell anyone that we are Christians, I mean, sometimes, you know, it would be like that, but people would always shout to us. We would come, we put people already knew. So, it was, yeah. Um, so being a Christian extreme metal band in the 90s, I think was, especially in Norway, was quite difficult. Because we didn't get acceptance in the 
the sampler in the black metal team, which was quite really that level and really exciting in our way back then. <laughs> and in, to be like a extreme Christian or metal bands of Christians uh, in the church landscape was also quite challenging. It's difficult to find people. Yeah. People would, you know, I always thought it would be the feeling that they needed to the grown-ups, our parents, uh, my uncle and aunts, they, they, the way they would support me would, would probably be, they would try to defend me by saying, yeah, it's really good that that these guys can use this music, this extreme music, to to uh, reach people that no one else can can reach. You know that was their way of defending uh, themselves, uh, like or defending us uh, in the church that we were part of, but also towards other churches. Kind of and it was the word to justify. But um, uh, I thought I would, I always had a bad feeling about that because uh, like 75% of the reason why I played was also because I, I just love playing that but I just love that brutal like screen music. So yeah, it was hard. And we, <coughs> in 2013, we um, recorded and we released our latest album. Have you guys heard all the latest uh, album from 2013? Yeah! yeah. Uh, at the same time, we released uh, Peter. Well, actually, the documentary that we made, the movie that we made, was not made by the band. It was made by Peter, the vocalist, and a producer. So, um, and they made this documentary at the same time as we were making the music for the US album we had out. That was quite challenging as well, because I hadn't been, you know, like uh, recording at that level for a while, uh, 20 years. So, um, yeah, uh, you guys are probably the reason why we exist. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, what both them uh, essentially started early on in the 80s in California. Over and over again, my friend.